Hey everyone, History Mystery Man here coming to you today from Paradise, the largest collection, private collection of open wheel race cars I've ever seen. Beautifully restored. The gentleman you are about to meet, Steve Trucian, is an absolute genius beyond the word. This story is so cool. It's become one of my favorites. You're going to love every bit of it. Welcome aboard. Rest assured, the history mystery man on duty and at your service. You see that? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. John, how you doing? Hi, nice to meet you. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you. I appreciate you tuning me into this opportunity. It's absolutely been fascinating. It's a story that needs to be told. Uh, I can't agree more. I'm surprised someone hasn't. Has someone already. Am I the first? You're the first. Wow. Shoot. We're gonna make it to PBS. Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares about what I'm doing. Oh, I don't believe that for a moment. <laughs> they will now. I can't imagine throwing this car into a corner on the Springfield Mile Dirt at 120 mile an hour. <laughs> oh man! Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't imagine the value of of the collection you have here. It's it's really cool. It's one of the neatest open wheel collections I've ever seen outside of walking through the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. This is really top notch. You should be proud. And you, you spiffed up all these cars, rebuilt well, them. I've essentially put them out of a pile. I mean, they were just came in a pile. You saved them. Well, you saved these. You saved this part of history. Well, that's what restorers do. I know. And thank God you're here. I, I can't imagine the man hours you have in bringing this collection back to life. Well, these cars always, they take a couple years well, of, I'm, of work, not full time, but you have to find the pieces that are missing, you know, looking for gauges and looking for the brakes and looking for the wheels and the tires and all this, all the parts. So there's 14 or 15 cars here times two, geez. That's well, a lot of time and energy. In addition to, I know you have a full-time business. We're not going to charge into that today. But I guess, for starters, I really admire you for having the courage and the energy to bring all this back to life. You have the full-time job, a business you run that your dad started. That's a cool story in itself. But I guess I don't know where you find the time and the energy to bring all this to life. There's a lot of hours in a week. Okay. What is your affiliation with the Afi? I've just been putting them together my whole life. Really? And making parts. And wow. I, I, oh, my dad worked on those engines, and as a kid I worked on them, and, and uh, then I started kind of in earnest working on them about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, and people were asking me to put things together but we didn't have any parts so I started making patterns and making castings and machining them and um, so I mean that's what I do and I, I thought this was all going to run out of gas years ago. But, <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> it didn't are, did it. People are still wanting this stuff. Oh my god that's amazing. You know I was going to ask about you know how do you get Offenhauser parts these days but you in fact machine your own yes? Is that what yeah. I'm hearing? Yes, a lot of stuff, and I'll show you that. Yeah, that's super interesting. And really, I don't try to do a whole engine. 
but I just make the parts that I need for what I'm doing. Sure. But, but over the years, I have patterns for most of most everything. Where did you get those patterns? Made them. You made your own patterns. Well, ex except that I do have some original patterns. I've, I've got an original pattern for a, a 36 degree turbocharged block. And I have patterns, original patterns for a 255 or 270 block. Um, we made patterns for a crankcase, uh, front cover, uh, gear towers, the side plates, the seal plates. So most of the engine I do have, um, I, I have the ability to make these pieces. Yeah. Most of the things that people bring me is they'll bring me a pile of stuff. That it used has, to be an Offenhauser? Well, or used to be several Offenhausers. And, okay. And maybe they don't fit together very well, and maybe they're yeah. short a few <laughs> things. Yeah. That's um, where your expertise comes in then. Yeah. That, that is so cool. I, it's, it's just interesting to me that there's still demand for Offenhauser parts, Offenhauser engines, the machining, the whole thing. It's uh, pretty amazing to me, too. Can I catch the phone? Uh, oh, sure. Absolutely. So, Steve, I know you have a beautiful collection of race cars going way, way back, including this one. I guess, did your dad drive this one? Yes, uh, my dad drove this car before World War II. Um, it's a, it was, it's considered a big car, which would be like a sprint car today. Sure, and, uh, an Indy car back in the day. Yeah, he was a uh, track champion in this car at Hammond in 19... Like 40, um, ran it at Milwaukee, Port Wayne, Dayton, Winchester, um, and he won the 3A race at Jungle Park in it in 1941. Wow! They they had this Jungle Park reunion a few years ago. They had they had it for several years, but it kind of went away. I think now. I think the pandemic did it in. Yeah, the pandemic did a lot of things in. There was a guy that wrote the book on Jungle Park. I have that. Uh, is it Tom Williams? Yes. He lives just a few miles from me. Does he? And I didn't know it, but I know now. Well, and I've talked to him from time to time. Interesting guy. Yeah, and he's the guy that gave me this big picture of my dad winning the race. Really? And do you have that picture? I have the picture here. Oh, cool, here. cool. So I want to see the... Go ahead. I'll show it to you later. You can right. take a picture of the picture. Lift the hood on this thing. I want to see this. Okay. Now, it looks kind of like an Offenhauser, but it isn't. W what are we looking at here? Well, this is a Miller. Um, the it's Miller. a 220 cubic inch Miller. Um, and it has a supercharger on it that was put on this car in, or put on the engine in 1935. It ran in 35 and 36 in the 500 with the supercharger. It had supercharger problems both years, so it didn't finish that well at Indy, but we, my dad, in 1937, my dad bought all of Shorty Cantlin's 220 stuff. He actually, he traded him a, a brand new 1937 Ford for it. And we have the original engine, the, the first 220 in his other car. And I think that's pretty well documented that that's the first one. And this is one of the early engines. And this is really the forerunner of all the Offenhausers. So. Exactly. The Offenhauser is an evolution of the, of Miller, the Miller built right. by Harry Miller. Yes. And I want to set this up just a little bit. So, so bear with me on that and you can chase it on the other end. But so, so a guy named Fred Offenhauser goes to work for Harry Miller in 1913. Offenhauser's just a kid in, in his young 20s. Uh, Offenhauser works as a machinist for Harry Miller. Well, in the 1920s, the Miller engines and the Miller cars literally dominated the 500. They won like, I think 12 500s with the engine, nine with the car, three of the Miller engines were in another car. Just, and, and Fred Offenhauser was up close and personal to that era, the Miller, which dominated at the Brickyard through the 1920s. Just, I mean, 80% of the fields then were, were Miller cars. Yes. So, so, and then uh, Miller goes belly up in the Great Depression, 1933. Uh, Fred Offenhauser steps in, buys all the patterns and all the equipment, 
and thus the Offenhauser engine is born, the Offenhauser again, an evolution of the Miller. And in and, and knowing that, I'm going to assume that a Miller and an Offenhauser kind of sound the same? Well, they sound exactly the same because they are exactly the same. Okay. I mean, what, what Fred Offenhauser did was, which Miller didn't do, Miller kept building different things, and one of these and one of those and, a, and five of these, but Fred Offenhauser realized that the 220 and the 270 were the money makers of the whole deal, and plus he, he made the 110 midget engine. And so he concentrated on those three engines for the, his whole tenure uh, of owning the country, company. Um, he sold it to Louis Meyer and Dale Drake, and they kept making the same stuff. So, I mean, the Meyer and Drake things, until the turbo engine, but the turbo off the 36 degree and the 22 and the 19 are all very closely related. They're built, they're built in exactly the same way, just some of the dimensions are different. I got you. So I think in, in, I think it was 1941 when Fred Offenhauser says, well, I'm going in a different direction. I'm gonna start building the Novi engine up in Novi, Michigan. Yes. And then, as you mentioned, uh, Lewis Meyer, three-time winner, first three-time winner of the Indy 500, in partnership with Dale Drake, purchased the Offenhauser brand in 46, and they ran with it. And that's where its greatest success came, I think. Offenhauser won 24 of 27 Indy 500s through the 50s and 60s. Just, I mean, the story is beyond, beyond cool. Well, there's there's our history lesson today. I won't I won't bog you down too much with history, I, but I do want to see the rest of the collection. Well, this you're, is you're the history mystery man. Well, that's true. But <laughs> I don't want to bore the viewers at home, but I, I think we're off to a great start here. So that's a Miller engine. You know, we, we brag about the Offenhauser. I've always said the Offenhauser, to me, I've never heard of Miller. I know it's the same initially, but the Offenhauser engine growing up as a kid was the greatest engine sound I ever heard. And it still is today. Well, um, I think you'll hear one today. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, 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 boy, that is exciting. <laughs> so cool. What, what, I mean, a Miller engine like that, can you put a value on it? I mean, gosh. Who's building Miller engines these days? Is there anyone else out there besides you? Well, I guess there's a few people that are goofing around with things, but um, you know, there's there's the market is really not large to go into mass well, production. Well, okay, I understand, but the for the Miller anyway. But is didn't we not cover that the Offenhauser market is is holding up pretty well all these well, decades I, later? Well, I mean, you can't sell a hundred thousand of them, but you can sell a couple a year. Okay. I'm I'm good with that. Maybe maybe four or five. Oh, excellent. Is there anyone else doing what you're doing? You know, building, rebuilding Millers and Offenhausers and. Well, there's some people assembling things, but I I make a lot of parts, which kind of gives me a head start in the process. So if someone else is going to rebuild an Offenhauser engine, at some point they're going to come visit you for parts. Probably. Wow, that's super interesting. So, I mean, I, I absolutely love this car, the boil. I mean, I, that, that boil products, I know, was on a lot of Wilbur Shaw's cars uh, when he was winning at the Brickyard. But uh, what, what are we looking at here? This is a 1931 Miller that uh, Boyle bought new. Um, it started its life out as, as a straight eight car. It was a big, called a big eight. It was a 230 cubic inch straight eight. Um, Cotton Henning took the 8 out of it in 1935 and put a 270 engine in it, um, which had been an Offenhauser engine at the time, a 270 Offie. Um, and Bill Cummings drove it as the national champion for several years. Wow. Um, now, stop just for a second. Bill Cummings, we're talking the guy who won the Indianapolis 500 in 1934? That's correct. Wow, but it wasn't in that car. It wasn't in this car, no. Uh, in 1934, you had to have a two-man car at Indianapolis, so the riding mechanic had to go along with the driver. I never, man, I never understood that. Can you imagine being a riding mechanic in one of these machines just? <laughs> well, I think uh, most of them died because <laughs> they were the first guy to the wreck. Oh, uh, I think they finally ran out of riding mechanics. Yeah, or some of the people that actually would do it, right. you know. I mean, because death was, I don't want to say almost certain, but it, the high probability of losing your life 
uh, was certainly all around. Well, the riding mechanic was supposed to pump the fuel pump and he was supposed to look out in the back because they didn't have any rear view mirrors, but they had already, re they had already invented a rear view mirror um, on the Marmon that won the first 500. It was a single man car and it had a rear view mirror. Right. The invention of that the, was the rear view mirror invention. Isn't that cool? The rear view <laughs> mirror, which we take for granted today, was invented in the first ever Indianapolis 500 in 1911 with Indiana boy Ray Haroon at the driver's wheel. That, that is, that's a cool story in itself. I mean, I, I love it. So Bill Cummings d drove this car to a national championship? Yes. That is cool. Didn't, didn't you tell me that uh, Louis Unser drove this thing also? Louis Unser drove this at Pikes Peak. Um, oh. <laughs> won three times, 38, 39, and 41. Wow. It also ran at Indianapolis in 1947 with Frank Warren driving it. That is so cool. I won't hit you hard on the values, but I mean, I, can you put, do you even, can you put a value on I something don't know. like that? I have no idea with That's the value okay. of anything. I got you. Whatever but, someone will give it, give I, you for I it, guess. I guess. You know, if you look at things that sell, it's all over the place. It, it depends on whether there's two people that want it, I guess. I got you. Wow. It, what a beautiful machine. I mean, I look at today's, you know, rear engine rocket Indy cars and the technology and engineering behind them is second to none. I get it. But in terms of character, I mean, this is prettier to me. I, I just love it. And I can't believe men did it without roll cages. You know, they had the, the driver had to keep the mechanical fuel pump pumped up. And they didn't have power steering. I mean, there were tanks. I have something interesting about this car. When it ran at Pike's Peak, they had a gear shift lever coming out of a hole over here. The handbrake is outside on the other side. Right, I didn't even talk about that. So he's pumping the fuel pump, shifting the, shifting the gear shift, and working the brake with his left hand. And I don't know what he's steering, steering with his knees. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't. I mean, you talk about gladiators. These men were amazing, just amazing. And that's, you know, I love auto racing. I always have. Uh, but what's going on today in auto racing is cool. I watch it. I love it. But it's not as interesting as this era when you could actually see the driver and the expression on his face. You know, it's so fascinating to me. I mean, the evolution of this sport is is beyond cool. Anyway, let's march on. What do we got here? Ooh, ooh, ooh. This is a 1977 Watson Silver Crown car uh, built by A.J. Watson. It's got a Chevy 355 in it. Um, Rich Vogler drove it. George Snyder drove it. Stevie Reeves, uh, Tom Bigelow. They won a couple of Silver Crown races. That's a cool list. Um, I think it's neat. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. And what I didn't know, I mean, obviously I knew that A.J. Watson built those awesome front engine indie roadsters of the early 60s to mid 60s. I didn't know he built upright champ cars too. So that was a new one for me. There were three cars built at the same time. One was the uh, Moran electric car, which uh, Greg Wilkie still owns. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one was the Plastic Express car that Chuck Gurney drove most of the time. I don't know. That was the black number the 30? black number 30. The other one is white. I th is a white number 7, I think. I, I remember that black number 30 that Gurney drove. But, and you say it was the exact replica of this car. Well, if they were both built. There was not a replica, but there were three cars built at the same time. I gotcha. Did you know A.J. Watson? Yes. You did? Yeah, he was a very interesting guy, and he was a friend, and he's been here. He has, um, he was. Years and years ago, I was working on an offie, and I had some questions, and I asked my dad, I said, you know, do you, do you know the answer to this? And he said, no, I don't. But he said, uh, Watson probably would. He said, you could call him up and ask him. I didn't know Watson at all, but I called him on the phone, and he answered my question, and he answered a lot of other questions, and he got to be a friend. 
um, then when I'd see him, you know, he'd ask me what I was doing. And um, I, well, I knew him for like 35 or 40 years after that. Well, you guys had a lot in common. <laughs> You're both innovators, creators. That's cool. He was an amazing man, wasn't he? Yeah. A.J. Watson. Wow. And I tell you, I still say the, I don't know, the A.J. Watson Roadster, the Indy Roadster, A.J. Watson Roadster was the prettiest race car ever built. I'm, I'm going to stand behind that. Uh, the Curtis Craft is right in there with it. Well, I think the, the, the Watson Bukovic. is a better looking car. Yeah, it is. They're, they're, and I haven't seen a, a prettier car since. Yeah. Shifting to a newer era. How far back do we go with this one? This was built in 1977. It's a Volstead. It's very similar to a Lightning, um, but it's a little bit smaller. It was run by Dick Simon most of the time. It had some other drivers right at the end. The car is just like it came off of the racetrack in 1983. Wow, it, 83. It okay. was the last Offenhauser powered car at the Speedway. And it has a 19 degree turbo offy in it. Makes about 1,400 horsepower. Is, is that a offy still in the car? Yes. As it came off the track? Yeah. And that's the last offy that ran at the Brickyard? Yes. In the, in the 500. That's cool. It's much more complicated looking than the first one. Well, you can hardly see the the engine for all the plumbing sure sure wow does it run yeah imagine that huh that's cool dick simon and he was a real true he's a quite an interesting guy and dick's still alive isn't he oh yeah, uh -huh. yeah. i'd love to meet him oh man now i love this I absolutely love this. Now I know there's a story with this, but 